Hello friends and welcome to another episode of Chapters on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in the tri-state region including West Virginia, Kentucky, and Ohio. And we're just delighted today to have Rob Merritt, our poet for tonight, um, speaking to us and talking to us about his book. Rob is a professor of English at Bluefield College in Virginia and the author of the poetry collections View from Blue Jade Mountain, The Language of Longing, and Long, Long, Landscape Architects, and the critical book Early Music and the Aesthetics of Ezra Pound. He's a member of the National Association for Poetry Therapy. He offers workshops on the healing power of expressive writing. He's taught poetry in China and is a board member of the Pearl S. Buck Birthplace Foundation. Currently, he's writing about personal mythologies, the geographical imagination, and connections between Chinese and Appalachian poets. I can't wait to ask you about that. Okay. Welcome to Chapters, Rob. Thank you. We're Connor. delighted you're here. We've got a lot of things to talk about. First, I want to know when poetry became your passion, or was it always? I think I was kind of a late bloomer because um, I learned to really appreciate poetry not even until I was in college. and. Um, and then I was mostly a reader of poetry then. <clears throat> but then um, I just started traveling around after I got my bachelor's degree. And I lived in many different places. And one of them was Oregon. And so I really started writing a lot of poetry out there. And I was kind of influenced maybe by the Gary Snyder type things in, in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, And then I've sort of been doing that, I guess, ever since. So, um, and, I, and the, my first book about the language of longing, I tried to talk about different places I've lived. And so there's our poems about Oregon, but also Florida and Spain and different travels. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. um, I guess it's not like from really young like some people, but I sort of grew into it. And um, I feel like I'm sort of blossoming now. Yeah, good. <laughs> Who's your favorite poet? Do you have one? I like a lot. You know, one person I really like is James Wright, who, um, you know, lived right across from Wheeling, West Virginia. And he mm -hmm. was... Um, just kind of wrote about sort of places that are have seen better days, but found really kind of beauty in in, in um, uh, things that have kind of faded out. And so I really like what he's doing. And then I do like some, uh, you know, speaking about the Chinese and Appalachian connection, like like Charles Wright, no relation, has done a lot of work with um, like the mountains and. Um, and sort of Eastern influences. So maybe the two Wright brothers. <laughs> <laughs> what does poetry give you in terms of the ability to write that prose might not? I've written some longer things which were actually nonfiction, like a critical book about Ezra Pound, but whenever, uh, I don't know, I, just, I feel like I really want to tell stories and a lot of my poems are narrative in a way, but I feel like I'm just so much more comfortable in something that's shorter where I can really focus on like the individual words and sentences and I, I just like the, the um, concision and the of poetry and uh, I, I don't I, I get sort of not really want to write anything too long I don't know I've tried but anyway I feel like I'm just more drawn to the shorter forms and yeah. you know, uh -huh. about one page. Kind of, if it's too short, I don't like that either. <laughs> right, right, I see. So. Um, for somebody who grew up, and the po only poetry I ever read when I was in college was, you know, the usual iambic pentameter and always rhymed, it's really different to read some of your poetry, which is. Do you call that free verse? Pretty much, I think. I mean, I feel like there's different sort of forms you can have. Like sometimes I've written some poems like in th three line stanzas, and I've tr written some poems in uh, like blank verse, which is like iambic pentameter. Mm -hmm. But um, I really don't like to rhyme, and I feel like that's kind of distracting. But I love plenty of rhyming poets like Keats and Shakespeare and, yeah. and Yeats are people that can really pull that off. But um, I don't know. I prefer maybe a more conversational type poem and really yeah. be thinking about the words but um yeah I like that phrase it is more conversational that, that makes good sense yeah how'd you get interested in Pearl Buck um well it sort of had to do with China actually and so um had you traveled there well I did get to, so I taught for um about a month in Nanjing China through this exchange program that we have at Bluefield College and so um one of the places that Pearl Buck in her later life taught was at Nanjing University. And so I saw a little place there. And so I sort of got 
began getting interested in um, like the Chinese poetic tradition, which sometimes are called the rivers and mountains poets, and uh, and they uh, lived out in the woods. Some one guy Han Shan, or his name was Cold Mountain, and I think he just lived outside or something. But anyway, they had a whole way of talking about um, mountain life. So anyway, then I'm thinking about wow, Pearl Buck. Um, was from West Virginia, yeah. and she had all these Chinese connections. And so uh, I feel like since I was from West Virginia, and so was she, and we both had this China sort of connection that um, I kind of wanted to pursue that more. And so um, I have been involved in the birthplace there in Hillsboro, which is I just, very... Yeah, I just came from Hillsboro. I was up there on Saturday. Did you Saturday. go into the birthplace? I have been there, yes. Don't just drive by like most people do on the wet snowshoe or something. <laughs> but it's a pretty amazing little place, and just to think about her Dutch ancestors, like building a place there in that plateau that um, was really was in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so I've learned a lot from those people connected with the birthplace and, and about her, and she... Um, it was all about civil rights. It wasn't just you know telling people about China, but she was really on the forefront of like women's rights and you know blacks in America and civil rights. And so I think a lot of people maybe don't know that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there's been several conferences that, w that have been held at um, Western Union Wesleyan and at WVU about Pearl Buck. And I just think she is such a resource for West Virginia. I mean, she mm -hmm. won the Nobel Prize for Literature, and I don't think she gets the respect she deserves. Probably and so, not. Do, do you find that the, the themes that, and the issues that she dealt with also influence your poetry? Well, one thing pretty interesting about her is like she was one of the few people to actually write about ordinary people in China, like mm -hmm. The Good Earth and those books like that. And so most of the Chinese literary tradition was always about the aristocrats. Oh. And so ironically, even though she was writing in English, she conveyed a lot about what the real life of the Chinese people was. And so... Mm -hmm. Maybe in that sort of way, I, I was be connected to her. Right, right. When was it that you were in China? I guess it's been about maybe six or seven years ago. And did you teach poetry? I did. And so you might think. Were uh, they English speakers? Well, they were. They were called English majors, and so um, it was. Um, yeah. So they were. Uh, yeah, they spoke English, and the, actually the best. Ac the best speakers of English in China have a British accent because they've learned from the BBC, uh -huh. and so. But anyway, with this exchange program we have, um, I was told I could teach anything, and so I said, well, I wouldn't mind teaching like American poetry and also creative writing, and I thought they would probably say, creative writing, no, but they said fine, and so they just put me in there. I didn't even have a guide or anything, and so I showed them some different poems by, I don't know, Wallace Stevens and Walt Whitman, and, uh, mm -hmm. and so they sort of got into reading that. I got them all to write we put together a little anthology. So they, oh, that's wonderful. And so um, I really love being there, and there's all the political stuff, but I just got to know the people, and my students got to hang out with the Chinese students. And uh, yeah, Was it, uh, were they traditional students or non-traditional students? I mean... Uh, tradi the, they were all traditional students. Yeah. Like, the, uh, the students that I took were, you know, several... Well, you took students I took as four well. students with me. I see, me. okay. And so one of them was, uh, or several of them were going to be elementary school teachers. And so they, and we got the opportunity to, to teach some classes to the um, Chinese students about using English. And so it was pretty neat how they did all these little games that they played for kindergarten, but it was a really good way of teaching the Chinese students mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. You know, so I really liked um, some of those older Chinese poets that I refer to, like Du Fu or Li Bai. And, I realized they were in the 8th century, like the time of Beowulf or something. Wow. And so the Chinese students were going, first of all, you don't know anything about what they sound like because every translation is bad. And, um, and what, you talk about something very old. And they were so interested in American culture. Did they know the older poets? But they had heard of them, but I think it gave them a, you know, a bad memory of something they had to do in school <laughs> or something like that. But they were so interested in American culture and all of that. So, uh -huh. But anyway, that was a great experience. So. Yeah, that's so talk a little bit more about the connection between the Chinese and Appalachian poets. Had you ever thought about that before? No, I never had. But now that you talk about them talking about the mountains and so forth, I can sure see that obviously there is that connection. There's kind of a neat tradition in Virginia. Like I mentioned Charles Wright, who was a Nobel laureate of America, plus you know he lives in Virginia, and he's just written a lot of poems about um, the, referring to different Chinese poets and stuff. But also... 
Jeff Daniel Marion is mm-hmm. a. Have you heard of him? And oh, so yeah. down there in the Holston, Tennessee area, and so. He wrote a whole book called The Chinese Poet Awakens, and he has just many poems about just the Chinese poets. And um, Rita Quillen, who's been very involved in writing fiction and poetry, wrote this great essay about connections between the Chinese and Appalachian poets, and like just that the, maybe the, the style was much simpler, and maybe the Chinese poets had more to teach the Appalachian poet about writing about mountains than, say, Coleridge or Wordsworth or something in the English tradition. Sure. And, um, one thing their I, landscape was a lot different. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but so it seems like, um, and also the maybe the British tradition is maybe more spiritual or transcendental or something like that, and it's more like maybe the Appalachian poet and the um, Chinese poet are just kind of just describing the landscape and just focusing on that. More down to earth. And you know, Eddie Pendarvis of mm-hmm. Huntington, she has a whole book called "Like the Mountains in China," and it's about. The mountains here in West Virginia look like the mountains in China. So those are several people. So just the, um, I tried, was working on a book about that, but I kind of pooped out. Well, there's probably five or six Appalachian poets that specifically refer to and imitate Chinese poets. Uh-huh. The rivers and mountains Chinese Yeah, poets. and of course, Eddie translated some of Pearl Buck's work for oh, that, children that's as right. well. That's right. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is that, does that connect to what you call geographical imagination? So when I was doing some research um, <clears throat> about this connection, that was a term. It's like, I didn't realize, you know, geography was like a course we took in <laughs> elementary school. It's kind of dumb or something. But now it's like a huge um, academic area of investigation. And mm-hmm. like Virginia Tech has a big department in that. And so it, I guess it has to do with how the imagination is influenced, influenced by geography, but also can influence the geography that it comes from. And so I just love that terminology and how, um, I guess, I mean, it's pretty obvious around here that the people's imagination maybe are influenced by mountains sure. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I think it can go the other way. About we don't have to, I don't know, look at things like like they're um, in a negative way, or there's been a lot of environmental damage, or various things that are not positive. But it's um, we can choose how we want to look at the landscape and find it to be a place that's really inspiring and rejuvenating. And, and so, I feel like a lot of those Chinese poets. We're doing that, I see. even though they were living in the same. Mm-hmm. Like I was, it's a similar landscape. Like they both have coal, the Chinese mountains and the Western New Mountains, and they both have ginseng. And then when I was talking about that at a conference once, somebody said, and also rattlesnakes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it really, it's an actual similar geographical um, foundation will make up between just the China and West Virginia oh, or the Appalachian area. Interesting. Yeah. So again, that, that landscape can be affected how people uh-huh. are responding to it. Uh-huh. Um, in the book, The Language of Longing, you use time and space and desire and loss and all of those things. Those seem to be things that matter to you. Um, talk a little bit about what, what inspired you to write that book. So the earlier book... Um, that came out in what, 2012? I think that's maybe correct. Um, it really has some points that have been um, I've written over a long period of time, whereas the second book, yeah, that is 2000. Yeah. Um, and so it covers a lot of different geographical areas and a lot of um, time. Mm-hmm. Because some of those were at least referring to when I was like in my early 20s or something. Oh, uh-huh. And so it might be a reflecting that I had a hard time growing up and I didn't want to write about it. <laughs> making house payments or something like that. <laughs> but I, I, as I wrote on the back of there, I mean, I think I'm really looking for some kind of pattern to all that wandering around. So like I did live in Oregon and Florida and Maine and different places in the United States and North Carolina where I'm from and different places in Virginia. And it can sort of maybe seem random, but then this was an opportunity to kind of look back over those different places and maybe do see some kind of pattern and how mm-hmm those different places affected my geographical imagination. And mm-hmm. I think that's a powerful thing that I, maybe it's selfish, but I get out of my, writing my poetry. It's like, it seems like it's putting a shape or finding a pattern in, in my life. And I think yeah. that's a, something I try to emphasize to my, different st- my students in different classes. And like, you have the power to tell your story and interpret it the way you want to and not the way you're told to by somebody else. Mm-hmm. And so that's such an empowering mm-hmm. way to feel about writing, I mm-hmm. think. Well, I think you also mentioned that it has to do with the ordinary 
rhythms of daily life. And I think that's something maybe that writers don't celebrate. It's it's too ordinary for them, you know. They think that's just mundane and nobody cares. But it is part of, it is what happens to everybody every single day. I know, and I think we have the opportunity to find the beauty in it or yes. something like that. And right. uh, um, I think maybe T.S. Eliot or somebody like that said, I mean, why would you want to keep writing poetry? I mean, everybody's already done it, like Shakespeare or even Eliot. And so why would a person want to even embark on that because it's already been done way better than anybody else could do it? But I've, Eliot was saying anyway that everybody has the opportunity to put that story into their own language. And, and, mm -hmm. and so I think maybe the kind of language I would be thinking about is would be what people are speaking in, in a kind of a normal way. And mm -hmm. so... Right. You know, a lot of people think a uh, poet, poetic language is just something that's absolute. Yeah, and all of that. very yeah. much so. Mm -hmm. And uh, and a poet who I do like a lot, W. B. Yeats, was pretty crazy the way he would chant the poems and different things like that. But um, it's really um, just trying to think how the ordinary words are really beautiful, and just the way you arrange them, and even if it's sort of like a ordinary sentence, you're still thinking about every word just like you would if it were mm -hmm. more highfalutin words. Mm -hmm. Well, you would do this, I mean, the same thing applies to fiction, you know, right. there have been lots of stories written a whole lot better than most of us can write them, but we still do it because we have something we think we want to say. Yeah. And I think that's the same thing with a poet. So, you know, I did write a book about Ezra Pound. I actually wrote a dissertation about Ezra Pound. And some people might say, why in the world would you do that? Because he had so many terrible views about, you know, politics and everything like that. But he really taught me a lot. And uh, he was really interested in prose writers. And one of his famous sayings was, poetry should be as well written as prose. And when he first started out, everybody was rhyming and doing all these really crazy early 20th century kind of things. And he loved writers like Flaubert, for example, who, was, who would, might spend a page describing a pillow or something and, and uh, it's still it's just it's so precise and so controlled and beautiful and even it's just an ordinary object that he's talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about your new book. Um, there's some, you, like you said a minute ago, they're very narrative. Uh, it's like you're telling the story. The one that I liked, I liked particularly were several. One, the one about Judy, um, it's very poignant. What inspired that or who inspired that? Is there a Judy? Yes, there is. And so one time somebody said, is that an old girlfriend or something? But actually, no, it was like I was in this writer's group and it was mostly older women who were in there and, and me. And so um, it was just a wonderful group because we would get together in this library on a Sunday afternoon and people would read their poems and then everybody would be quiet and they just made the best comments. And they were just very focused and really useful. And one time, I read a poem, and um, they said the first part of that's not that good. And so, and so I sent that poem to a, um, a journal, and I got it published. And they said, "Would you mind taking out the first ten lines?" And so, some of the comments that the, these they ladies, were right on. yeah, they were right on. They were. Anyway, so then they got older, and I know people got busy, and so um, I sort of lost touch with them. And so, but I finally did find out where Judy was, and that, and so she was, and she was actually in this Alzheimer's home in the same city, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where I was born. And so I went down to see her and yeah, that was it was really, a pretty was powerful. Cause, and, um, and I went back to see her and she didn't even move out of the bed. And then she since died after that. Uh, yeah. But she was had a great sense of humor and she, I went to a, a memorial service and she had t two poems that she had written that she wanted to have read at her you know, funeral. Oh, that's, that's great. And it was, the that's gist great. was, don't cry for me. Uh -huh. Wow. <laughs> and so, so I guess a lot of those poems, that's pretty, I'm just telling an autobiographical story sure in a are. way. Yeah. But I like to see how maybe different things can be put beside each other because that was that same day there was that Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. Mm -hmm. And so even though that might not seem related to the other thing, I think that's a, kind of a thing that I'm interested in in writing is trying to put things together which might not seem like they're Mm -hmm. Connected, but all right. Then, in that case, tell us the, about the title of the book. View from you, do you Blue know where Blue Jade Mountain, Mountain is? I do not. No. <laughs> well, I invented it's in it. The, oh, you did. <laughs> well, no wonder I don't know. It's obviously in the Blue Ridge in your mind. So, the Blue um, Ridge. yeah. So it's a place like Yak Nak Patafa County or something <laughs> like of Faulkner, and it's like 
a place I kind of invented. Uh -huh. And so... Um, but it does uh, well describe the color from a distance that mountains take on. Yeah. You know, they do have a, a dark blue green look to them. So I meant the jade um, to have some, you know, reference to China yes. and I'll talk about it in that little introduction there. And so I meant, I kind of wanted that title to reflect maybe the mixture between the, you know, eastern and western um, mm -hmm. locations. And so uh, I'm, I guess saying I'm trying to maybe influence my or the reader's geographical imagination by thinking a little bit about some of the eastern perspective on things. Mm -hmm. um, so the the poem in there called Why Don't You Stay Just a Little Bit Longer is clearly an ode to the Blue Ridge Mountains, right? Yeah, I think it's um just amazing. Well, why do so many people, I mean, a lot of people have left, of course, especially in some places in West Virginia where I live over there in McDowell County. Um, but so many people stay, and, and, and that was actually a theme in the epigraph I put on there um, from the Chinese poet. It goes, why do, you, why do you stay on Green Mountain, a poem by Lee Bai, and he goes, I just smile and you know, enjoy you know, the solitude. And so I wanted to use the term um, in migration because it's always talking about out migration. And mm -hmm. so like, I did move from Lexington, Kentucky, over to southern West Virginia. And, um, I didn't think I was going to stay that long, but I've, now it's been um, almost 30 years, and I have really kind of love it. I know there's a lot of sad stories and everything yeah. about what has happened, but um, um, I think it's interesting to everybody to ask, you know, why they're staying where they're staying. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, um, and how about unwinding the road? Is that your daughter you're talking to? No. No, okay. <laughs> But my daughter is the one who actually took the picture that's on the cover oh, of that okay. book. And so, right. But it's a person I used to know a long time ago. We were younger. We went like a college friend. Mm -hmm. And then, and we did travel around some together. And then it was, you know, she uh, just uh, came on sort of hard times about, you know, her job and everything. And so um, I guess I was trying to think about a way to, remember the good times that we had and but it was in a way kind of sad that mm -hmm. what had sort of happened to her and so do you have a favorite poem in this book i do like that judy poem pretty much yeah. and i i kind of like that poem one of the poems is about um pearl buck and a, a book i read about her um about her mother that's called book report yes i like that can you read it could you read it i could so See, so I was looking for a, um, maybe something to read by Pearl Buck besides um, The Good Earth that mm -hmm. a lot of people have read. Um, and so, actually, I'm sure you know Kirk Judd, and he yes. said, um, you know, a great book to read is um, The Exile, which is a biography that Pearl wrote about her mother, Carrie. Mm -hmm. um, it was really a pretty amazing book, and um, just the power and, and strength of character that these people had to live you know, through all of... Um, the toughness in um, China and her father, he just didn't want to just be a missionary. He wanted to go to the most remote places in China and try to help people. And so he was like not around that much. And um, anyway, I could sort of self explain to her, but I wanted to read that book and it was, I couldn't find it on Amazon. And so I teach at a really small college and they don't have a lot of resources in the library, but for some reason they had, that they had this one. So <laughs> I should read that now? Yes. Because the name of that book was The Exile. So, I read The Exile by Pearl Seidenstricker Buck. About her mother Carrie. About the exile she felt returning home to the mountains of Hillsborough, West Virginia. Every ten years. An outsider there, as in China. That book out of print I found at the library of the small college where I teach. Did the Baptist librarians in the 1940s know that after following her husband Absalom through the fetid ghettos of China and watching three children die in her arms, Carrie hated St. Paul and his legacy. But there was one card in the pocket of that book. It was last checked out by Kay Lawrence on April 1st, 1974. The same year that I waited to get out of college, scared of Vietnam, reading Jack Kerouac on my back porch, 
A Baptist girl in the Blue Ridge Mountains on April Fool's Day touched a woman's bittersweet biography of Far Away. Only the faintest pencil linings. Kay knew not to mark in library books. But she underlined, beauty was a sort of oxygen that gave her life energy. So at a college where men wore flat tops in 1974, Kay launched her blossoming. Carrie cultivated her sensuous nature, singing in the flourishing gardens that she had made upon whatever hard plot she found at the family's ever-shifting residencies. And Kay, she underlined, music is not technique and melody, but the meaning of life itself, infinitely sorrowful and unbearably beautiful. Did Kay become a piano teacher, or a weaver of tapestries, or the wife of a missionary? The underlining stop on page 67. Carrie went to heaven, and her zealous husband went to his. One night in Zhenjiang, men, angry at foreigners and drought, came to Carrie's house to kill her. Her husband Absalom was out, and she was ready. The lights were on, the doors were open, and a party with her children. She offered tea and cakes to dark men. Her recipe for courage was faith, beauty, hospitality, and the innocence of children. The men drank tea and ate, for they were hungry, and departed, axes dragging in the dust. So I open these dusty leaves of a book to the sun after 40 years in this restorative air of the mountains, and I can feel Kay feeling pearl, listening to Carrie, singing the wisdom of exile. Who knows? God may like laughter and dancing and beauty. That's really beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very so much. I, I just... When, what, what's next? Are you working on another... Poetry I do have a, um, so I might read a few things tonight that are uh, some recent things I've read and um, my wife and I had a chance to go to Italy not too long ago and so that I've written some, some, some Italian poems about that and um, I don't know do you think people write love poems anymore I don't know but <laughs> it's worth revisiting I but think. I'm thinking about how writing about that and my relationship with my wife who I love and I don't oh, know and uh well you can also write love poems to Italy you can to travel to you know whatever inspires you right and I so so I guess I'm thinking about you know maybe points about personal relationships uh -huh. and um again I traveled to Italy and I've tried to you know reference Dante in one poem that I was working on in that and so you, um, let me ask you just a little bit about um, that as a part of what you talk about about workshops ex how, ex how writing is therapy I'm really so interested in that now, that was a great conference for a lot of people to go to that I could recommend which is called it's the National Association for Poetry Therapy and it's mostly counselors and different people who but use um, bibliotherapy or you know personal expressive writing to with their clients and um, one reason I really enjoy that is because sometimes, you know, poetry is a tough work, you know, teaching to college students, but um, to be around this group of people that really use that. And so um, I, I got one idea that I've talked about earlier that from Virginia Woolf, who like, you can control your story when you write it down. It's pretty amazing. Like something happens to you, something that you're cons even traumatic in your past, and it's always controlling your memories. And you can say, I'm not going to do that anymore. Can actually write that down mm -hmm. and so um, I know a woman and she maybe this is a little simplification but she works on people's metaphors and that's part of her you know counseling practice and so you come in and say I'm up against a brick wall I'm in a corner and she goes well, how do you get around that brick wall do you see enough? and so she takes the person's metaphor and works that to well, a way to get out of their dead end that they've gotten into wow. and I, I think that is so powerful because everybody is, is working with metaphors mm -hmm. and sometimes they're not the useful metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know, this year it's gonna, the conference is going to be in Albuquerque and the, we've had some great keynote speakers, but this time it's um, Jimmy Santiago Baca, who is, you know, he learned how to write in prison wow. and write poetry in prison. And so 
Um, I've read a number of uh, articles about the use of writing as a way to help prisoners kind of cope with what they're having to. Yeah, get I know through. some people in Western New writers like Eric Fritzius, mm -hmm. I think, is in a, in mm -hmm. a, some other people have worked, have worked in prison. Yeah. And there's some amazing just research about just physiological benefits from writing even traumatic stuff down. And so I've taught a couple of courses about that at the college. And like, the, it's amazing the just scientific data about just getting things off your chest. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's, as somebody says, it's cheaper than Prozac. <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> and it's cheaper than a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. And ironically, um, <laughs> this poetry therapy was kind of started in one person um, named Ken Gorelick did some work at St. Elizabeth Hospital in Washington, D.C., and some of the first work with patients was there. And it's the same hospital that, where Ezra Pound was when he, I don't know if you remember that, but he was yeah. in a hospital for 10 years after World War II because they were going to execute him for treason unless they decided he was insane. And so they put him in wow. there. So like two interests that I have of Ezra Pound and this poetry therapy all was in the St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Huh. That's just that's pretty amazing. <laughs> so I got to go there and check yes, it out. Yes, absolutely. Sometime. But I really do believe in that ex expressive healing thing. And we have a little group um, at Bluefield College that's like called the New Opportunity School for Women. And it started in Berea, actually. And so mm -hmm. women come and they take these different classes about self esteem and various things. But one of them is about you know expressive writing. And mm -hmm. like one time I said, just write down something that, traumatic, or maybe I didn't use that word, but you want to get off your chest and then we just wrote it on the paper and then we took it outside and put it in a little box and set it on fire. Oh, so they didn't have yeah. to share it, but they got it out. Uh-huh. That's good. And I feel like that really meant a lot. I, to I bet it did, yeah. Most of them. Anyway. Yeah, that's great. Uh, if you had a dinner party and could invite three poets, living or dead, who would they be? Well, I just loved Mary Oliver and, oh, you know, yeah. and she uh, just died. I know. And, she was a big dog. I would love her, and I had, I had a beagle that I lo loved a lot too. I'd love to talk to her, and um, uh, it would be great to talk to Emily Dickinson and find out what all was going on back then. And um, uh, I don't know. One time I got to hear, and I wouldn't mind talking to him a lot more. Was Jim Wayne Miller? Uh -huh. Did you ever know him? No, he. No. And he, but I just love those Briar poems and all that stuff and um, I just think he, he was a genius about how he wrote about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. One person I did get to invite to a dinner party who came to Bluefield for a week as a visiting writer was James Steele. Oh wow. And he was just the kindest, wisest man, you know, and, and I really enjoyed mm -hmm. talking to him. How about Wendell Berry? I mean, I would love to have a conversation with him. Right. You know, he was actually teaching at the University of Kentucky when I was there and oh. I sat in on a class and uh -huh. like, it was all about you know landscape, and he was talked about you know, as you like it by Shakespeare. He had all these you know nature writers that went all the way back in it, but he was always mm -hmm. had an interesting take on it. But yeah, well, his, he's amazing. He certainly has a deep respect for the for the earth and for the. And I love those Sabbath poems. I think there's a lot to be learned from those. I mean, they have a spiritual component and a nice little shape to them, and everything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Do you ever write haikus? I mean, I've tried to write some. Uh, it's hard to tell if they're good or, I mean, I can't. Somebody <laughs> said it's easy to write a bad haiku, but it's hard to write a good one. Um, and one time I saw Robert Haas, that po and, he, and he's done a lot with haiku, and he gave a reading, and it was, he could mm -hmm. give those little three-line points, and he would yeah. say, there's always a flash of lightning in a really good one. Yeah. Tell, tell the audience exactly what a haiku is. Well, it's only a three-line poem, and it's, I don't know, it's hard to, like, it's supposed to be, according to the English translation, it's like a five syllables and seven syllables and five syllables, and usually it's supposed to be something to do with nature and how that might kind of be a metaphor for your feelings, and um, I think what's I like about that, and maybe what I like about the Chinese poetry is that, like, it's sort of reticent, it's holding back on, you know, just becoming real gushy and everything, and it's just mm -hmm. trying to let kind of the image tell the story, which I think is a really important you know, thing to try to put in a poem. I think and that's one of the things that I notice most about poetry is that it is more image driven than other kinds of prose, than prose yeah. is, than fiction is. And I think you have to really be observant to be able to be a poet because you, you, you focus on the images and how they relate to what you're trying to say. 
you know, like, I mean, one of the very innovative modern poets was William Carlos Williams, and he was a doctor, right? So he had all that observing people to make a diagnosis, and he mm -hmm. put, put it in all these little short poems. But uh, I've come across some interesting things that, that students think, like, they actually, when I say stuff about the image like that, they go, really? I, I think it should just be very abstract with all these generalizations and let the reader decide what, and they really, there's a deep ingrained idea that the image is not really essential to the poem, which I don't agree with that. Because mm -hmm. okay. I think the poet should have some idea in mind what is trying to be communicated, and then of course right. the reader can make it up. But they have to be given information to make some judgment, and you can't just throw a bunch of abstract words out there and make them control their feelings. It's right. like cheating or something. <laughs> so the, I think the good poet would give you the image and then have some feeling in mind behind that and then hopefully the reader would kind of pick up on the same thing yeah. without having to come out and say it. Right, right. And so you might say, why well, do it the hard way? Why don't you just say it? But I mean, no, well, then life is not like that anyway. No, and that's <laughs> like the same thing they say about um, even a story. Don't give them all the details down to the nth degree because then they can't put themselves into that story. Yeah. And there, there's no empathy created. And the same thing would be with, with true with poets. You gotta be able to put yourself in it. Yeah. Same thing with a painting for that matter. Don't tell somebody where it exactly is if you're painting a creek because then they can't imagine whether it's their creek or not. But you have to let the reader have the, an experience. Yeah. Which is like right. that's why the best right. poets like like I don't know Wordsworth. You just like, you're going a little down. The, you're walking down the path with him. And you can just see everything he's describing. Sure. And right. Again, Wordsworth seems sort of ordinary. It's just like really that's you're just walking, and looking at the flowers. But you're like that. It's like you're in a movie or something. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much for being with us. This is going to wrap it up for today. Um, we want to thank the Inner Geek also for providing us with our tech. tech with our support, our technology support comes from Doug Morris, of course, but we're delighted to be here at the Inner Geek. And we encourage you to come to the Inner Geek to pick up books that you need. And if you are thinking about somebody who's been on chapters before, ask whether or not their books are here. We hope they are. And it's been wonderful to have you, and we'll be back again another day. Thank you. Connect with chapters via email. Write to lp4 at zoom.email. Chapters has a Facebook page at Armstrong Chapters. Like, subscribe, and follow. All chapter episodes are available on YouTube. Visit Armstrong's YouTube channel, Follow Armstrong, and look for a playlist of all the chapters programs.